Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, so this isn't a type of session where you just sit there and listen. <laughs> you're going to contribute, or you're going to find out a bit later. Um, my name's Scott Draw. I'm the director of sport here. Uh, this is part of a series that we're going to run once a term, that I just really um, called the Education Sport Series, which is just be looking at um, aspects of development and learning across multiple domains, whether in the classroom, uh, in the music hall, or in the sports field, what you see here. So the title's called Being Brilliant. It's how to use pressure to be the best you can be. And it's really about the principle of how we prepare individuals for their journey, rather than what we see often happening is we try to prepare the path for the journey they're going to go on. So the reality of the world that people move into, whether it's in high performance sport or in business or in university, is there'll always be challenges that everyone's got to work through and respond to. And, and a lot of it's how do we prepare individual, individuals for those so they can be the best they can be. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk through some information, but also want int to just introduce you to the panel. Um, if I ask them just to start on the left, so you get to know who they are. Dan, if you can start over there. Dan Hellas fire I'm a cricket coach here. Uh, Alan Richardson, Director of Athletics here at Millfield. Janet Adamson, Director of Netball. I'm Rhian Fox, Head of Dance. I'm, I'm Alexandra Hayden, I'm Deputy Head Academic. So w once we've been through some of the basic introductions of what we're going to try to do today, we're going to have some conversations which you can contribute to as well, but just to explore various, various aspects around pressure in different domains and how we use that to develop people to be the best they can be. Um, so as I mentioned, the Sport and Education series is really about an exploration of hot topics that cross boundaries. We'll use going forward certainly a mix of in-house and guest speakers to come and share their experiences. But it is about a lot more about shared life experiences. This is not theoretical. This is about real things that people do uh, in the real world and how they've learned from those which hopefully we can all share. There's going to be a little bit of audience interaction with a tool called Mentimeter. So you can get your phones out at a particular time and we're going to ask you some questions to get your views and opinions on various aspects of what we discuss. Um, and if you've got a question to the panel, you can go to Twitter, Mirfield Sport, I'll be picking those up and we'll use those in some of the discussions that you can pick up as well. So if anybody says something of interest or something you really want to explore, please send your question through or if you do want to ask, please put your hand up and we'll take that as we go through some of the discussions as well. But the question that we're going to try to explore today is like why we need pressure to develop. Often we view pressure as being negative in the context of development but you need enough pressure to be the best you can be as well. So we're going to explore that aspect of it today um, through some of the conversations. So I think it's worth going through what pressure is, because as you say, there is a connotation that pressure is always bad, but the reality for anyone in development, it's an important part of what you're going to experience. So as people develop, how are we going to structure and use it in the right way so people can be the best they can and are be prepared for the path they're going to face? So we typically look at pressure in two scenarios, physical stress, so very much heightened neurophysiology, and if you're in sports, it's often getting the game face on, getting ready for a particular experience, and of course, when you get that wrong, it can lead to different, different examples, injury, physical exhaustion, and psychological stress, which could be alertness, focus, a concept called psychological flow. There's a great book, a great psychologist, about how you get in that moment, in that zone, at that moment in time, where anything and everything you do seems to come off at the moment. But it can lead to repeated errors when you don't get it right, really poor attention, concepts of choking, and all of that we would often, often see. So what does pressure do to your decision making? Well, I've been really fortunate to work with a guy called Vincent Walsh at UCL, who's done some amazing work in sport and in other domains that looks at the impact it has on decision making when people feel under pressure. So one of the questions I have for you is what type of decision maker are you when that pressure emerges? So he would talk about people being gunslingers. So when that pressure's on, very fast in the moment types of decisions. He would talk about people being poker players. They're very probabilistic in the decisions they make. Uh, when into those situations, so your physiology's up, situations are challenging, and then they also talk about those people that decide to play chicken. They're unprobabilistic decision makers, and that's how they respond in those types of moments. And typically, when you test people in labs, they end up being one of those or, or an emergence of them. So I'm sure you can reflect on your own scenarios and think about when you're in those, in those situations and how that influences your decision making. So the question we have is how can you use pressure in the right way? Um, and again, there's some great work done in sport looking at those challenges and how you use them so people can bounce back and be the best they can. And it isn't just in the sporting scenarios, it's in any part of life that we endure. So that's going to be the, the aim of what we're going to try to explore today, particularly among this group. Please feel like you can contribute to the discussions, as I've mentioned. Um, and we're going to start some of those contributions. So if you can get out your phones, you're welcome the phone in this environment. If you go, this is another tool I'm trying, to mentimeter.com. And I want you to complete that sentence. 
Tell me what you think. There's no right or wrong here. Share your own experiences when you've been in scenarios where it hasn't felt quite right, or you've really responded to being in a competition environment where you think you should be under pressure, but you responded really positively. So where does pressure come from? Expectations? Well, it's the idea of a word cloud, those things that we hear consistently or obviously come up and be a bit greater. So yeah, within yourself, expectations, parents. It's a great experiment. Thank you for contributing. <laughs> OK, we're going to hold that. The second question, what creates the most pressure for you? Yourself, teammates, teacher coach, parents. Great, so we're going to explore some of that with the panel. Um, thank you for taking the time to share some of those thoughts. <laughs> Great. And, and as we were sort of planning for this discussion, I think one of the thoughts was for the panel to show a bit of vulnerability to everybody. <laughs> and, and all of the individuals on this panel have at times um, probably been in a situation where we had to respond to that environment. So, and I'm just going to carry on with you and maybe Dan if you can add, but can you sort of give us, an, uh, I guess, a personal example where you as a coach in the examples have faced pressure and how you've handled it and managed it? Yeah, so my, my really big one was as, as an athlete when I was, when I was performing, competing, I, my coaches, I was really lucky to have some great coaches and we prepared really well for me going into major championships, going to British championships, Olympic trials. And then as a coach, I was really looking at 20, 28 and 29 years old, I, I went as a, as a team coach and national coach to first world championships. And suddenly I was in an environment where I'm coaching people in a world championship qualifying in a final and been responsible for, for supporting their performance. And nobody really prepared me for what that meant as a coach. And I'm standing with my idols, ultimately with the people I've grown up, even when I was competing, thinking, these are the guys that I read what they write. I watch every lecture they give. This is who I want to be. And standing next to them and thinking, right, what I say here, I don't want to embarrass myself because I don't want to say something stupid in this environment. And nobody had really prepared me to be in a stadium as a coach with 60,000 people, with my idols, and working with an athlete who was reliant on me for the external part of their feedback, where they were going to then drive their performance, which is their livelihood. Um, and that, that kind of pressure for me was, how much do I say? What don't I say? Which, as I found out later on, on a big review process with a couple of my mentors, was really important, what not to say. Um, how I manage my emotion, how I don't transfer that nervousness to, a, to, to an athlete. Now, we were really lucky because they performed really, really well. But as part of that review process was, in the opinion of myself going forward, was kind of probably in spite of me rather than because of the sport I gave them. And they were probably more experienced in that environment than I actually was. So. Mm. And Dan, have you ever been in a situation, so you, you coach at very highest levels of cricket, and you know you work within a school environment as well, where have you felt the most pressure and most fear when you're in a situation with, um, with athletes? Well, initially when I started coaching, it was very much of when I had a conversation with someone and they had something that I didn't know, and I felt that, oh, I, they know more that, about what's going on here than I do. And I initially took that as uh, a reaction that I reacted back to because I didn't feel comfortable with the athlete at the time knowing more about the subject than I did. So it instantly put me on the back foot and a lot of pressure of assuming that I should be the one that knows everything about what's going on here. And having gone through a period of time of working with a few people that know a lot more about cricket than I do, actually coming to terms with being able to deal with moments where you know full well that the person you're talking to knows a lot more about what you're talking about than you do and accepting that and almost taking that as that's going to happen instead of putting the pressure on myself to be able to try and come up with a competent answer that I'm just plucking out of nowhere effectively. In, in the domains that you work in, what would you do to develop fun and passion in people for what, what they're studying or trying to become excellent at? I think in dance, I see dance as a communication. So actually there is a pressure to perform, but there's a bigger ambition going on that kind of rides over that pressure. So it's communication, it's talking, communicating, expressing to the audience, or having something that's greater than that, that one moment, so that we're contributing to something that's bigger than us almost, and that message then take that, kind of absorb, dissolves that pressure a little bit, or gives you a greater motivation, because there's an impact that we, we're looking for. And I think that's lovely about dance, actually, yeah. that you can communicate through that. I want to be Alex and the, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, interested people are interesting to be around. So I, I, I have 
a sort of thing where you have, if you have a teacher that's interested in what they're teaching, then they're going to come across as, as, as really passionate and they're going to be interesting to, to listen to in the classroom. So um, that's, that's something that I think is really important. How do you become interested in your subject? Well, you were once interested in it because you studied it at university. So how do you perpetuate that going forward? For me, you know, I bore my family intensely with the amount of Radio 4 I listened to, you know, Sunday Times magazines, there's um, you know, some excellent blogs and reading, reading, reading all the time. And then you bring a little bit into your lesson and you wave your arms about and you go, oh my goodness, isn't this amazing? And then everyone goes, oh, maybe, oh, yeah, okay. Um, and you kind of get whipped up in the moment. Um, and that's what I try and, try and engender in my teaching is that real excitement. You know, all these subjects are fascinating. That's why they're on the school curriculum. Um, and we have got to uh, make sure that we bring that passion into our lessons and really convey it how interested we are in our subjects and, and, and pull them along with us. And Jenny, you were really fortunate. A couple of weekends ago, you were coaching for Wales um, and you had a new group of girls that you've sort of been working with going into a, a big tournament competing <laughs> against some of the home nations. What did you do to make them feel like it was fun and they were, gonna, you know, they were there for the right reasons? Yeah, um, we, well, we, our training block was sort of five weeks and before that. Um, and whilst a lot of it is all tactical, it's, you know, less technical at this point, um, we're still having fun. We're still playing, you know, fun warm-up games. Um, and we are still, you know, doing silly little kind of team building games as well to keep the team culture going um, and to make sure that everybody goes into that feeling relaxed and that there's... Whilst there is the pressure, actually, there isn't, because although we've set a goal and we know where we want to go, um, probably a little bit more of an underdog in that, and I think there was less expectation, or perhaps more in some respects with how well we'd done at the Summer Test Series. So I think everyone went into it quite, um, quite relaxed, but with a very clear um, focus, and it's a great group to work with um, in terms of culture and just the support that they give to each other. So um, in that respect, it was pretty easy. So, Alan, one of the points you made was just about the importance of the preparation period. So if you're to take a look out, you know, we have a major significant event a year out. Um, we know that's going to create a different environmental scenario for everyone in which they've got to execute something, whether that's an exam paper, whether that's a particular playing performance, whether it's something in the music hall or the dance stage. I mean, what, what's, just talk us through that preparation period. What sorts of things you would practically do that will prepare people for what's going to come because sometimes it's really hard to replicate the reality of the major significant events so what, what things have you tried that, um, that, that in the past well i'm really interested in different high performing environments so whether it's a military um and i read that, a lot of books around things like the sas and special forces cause, and then if you look at when when pep first started managing barcelona he changed the entire way they prepared so i think it all comes down to that initial preparation at the start so what are your technical and physical skills like for what you've got to do so whether it's your understanding of politics and an a-level politics or whether it's i'm a pole vaulter and actually i've got a performance to do i know the thing that's going to break down the most under pressure is my baseline skills to, to undertake that task. So what we're trying to do, so we, we look at this time of year in athletics where our major performance is in June or July. This is a really great time in terms of general preparation to say, right, what are the physical qualities I'm going to need in June and July? Well, we need to take care of those. What are the technical qualities I need to do? Well, there's not a lot of pressure right now because we are, we're quite a long way from that big performance. So we can spend a lot of time on on small baseline skills that are going to that are going to then be be really excellent by the time we get further along that, that pathway. Then when we're in our pre-competition or our specific competition phases and we're saying well actually those technical skills are, are really strong so how are we going to make it more like the competitive performance so it might be instead of jumping from a short run up we're going to jump at slightly from a longer run up so that it's actually challenges in terms of time and speed so that's a challenge we're going to put into place we might start trying to replicate competitions so whether we have a handicap system between boys and girls and the, the girls the girls get 80 centimeters on the, on, on the boys and we're going to see who wins that competition in training so we're starting to add a little bit of pressure because they care about beating their training partner or whether we're going to um, start to look instead of, instead of handicapping it uh, we're going to look at something slightly different so we have a, a 
competition against themselves. So we do things like nine nine jumps with a, a real bias server training bar that is you you choose your opening height and we do it one week and we're going to do it again in four weeks. If you knock it off, it comes down ten centimeters, and if you if it goes if you clear it, it goes up by fifteen centimeters. And we're trying to see how high we can jump, and we're going to repeat that process in a month. So whether it's a a little competition at that point of the year where we're preparing for to deal with some of that stress um, and we're dealing with it from an internal from just ourselves or whether we're doing it against that kind of other person competitive scenario um, where we where we can add that in and I think those things between really great technical skills and then try and stress them and then look at them in a non-judgmental environment that isn't impacting on our big goal to say what went well, what didn't go well, okay, what we're gonna do for the next four weeks to try and to try and work on that. So much like if you have an exam paper, go back and review it and look at it and, and make changes and make make additions and, and how we do that. We're trying to do the same thing in a sporting context. Yeah. So and open to everybody else really any stories or experiences of things you've tried in those preparation periods to get people ready for a significant event? Yeah, it can when you have um, you know during your time it, progressing towards an exam you'll have tests and then you have a mock exam and you can either just say right oh, I got 80% and park it and or you can say right I'm actually really going to take apart this exam paper and take apart my performance on that exam paper so you break it down you know what the assessment objectives are you break down every sub question you can work out and say oh well, I got 70% on AO1 which is factual knowledge but I only got 30% on applying it so I need to really work on those sorts of questions um, and then once you've broken your performance on the paper down, you can actually break it down and say, what are my next steps? What am I going to do now to improve for next time? Um, and then once you've got those next steps, park the paper and move on to the next things. And I think that's really important about you know, parking a performance and saying, right, now I can move on from that. Um, but you can't move on until you've actually analysed what, what you've learned from that particular performance point. And Rianne, what about from a dance perspective? I think we know when I'm looking at dancers and their performances, and I've had fabulously strong dancers who at performance lose the alignment, lose the expression. And actually we know that under stress, there are particular muscles in the body that contract. And so that can distort everything that we've done. That can distort all the shapes, that distorts the expression. Um, your heart beats faster, so they go too fast and they're out of time with the music. Their breath is up, so they, their fatigue is greater. So there's all of these ideas coming through. So actually, right from the beginning of a, rehearse, you know, a preparation period, we're planting the seeds for that. So we're planting almost the routines or the habits that they learn, they're learning now. And then by the time we get to March, the muscle memory has taken over a little bit and we can still find that extension, we can still find that expression. That, so you're kind of counterbalancing the effect of that kind of stress response and that pressure that happens. Making it more automated. Yeah, and, and you build on top of that, but that, if that's our, our base, then we're hitting, you know, we're doing what the body, we want the body to do in space, which is what we like. And Dan and Jenna, different, any, any different examples of things you've been involved with that you've really tried to help somebody prepare for something? Maybe? Yeah, I think the key one that I've personally experienced is knowing the person that's in front of you. Uh, being in a team sport that is actually quite highly individual, there's one person batting at any one time, one person bowling. You do get a varied range of how people perceive the pressure that's in front of them. So you'll have people that will be panicking three days out because they've not done everything they wanted to do at practice that you need to bring back down into the here and now in comparison to someone who you have to kick to get to training to actually prepare them in the right way to be there and understanding what those people have got in place and how that does look and how that does actually prepare them and if they stray away from that making sure that you can effectively be on top of them and challenge them and make sure that they're in the right frame of mind for those people. And, and Jenna, earlier today we were talking about those examples of the three championships that you've been through and different things that you learned about how to get the guys ready to perform on the day. Do you want to share some of that with yeah, me? Yeah, so um, obviously it, it depended on the environment that I was in, but um, an example sort of that I used with Wales was that um, in that five-week training block um, in preparation for Netball Europe, we spent a lot of time working on um, like constraints and times and you know, what do we do? It's similar in terms of like your annual plan in that, you know, you've sort of nailed your technical and it becomes automated and then your tactical is exactly the same. So you know what to do on a back line, you know what to do on a centre pass. 
um, and we spend a lot of time working on, on time. So what happens if we are you know, three goals up and you know, there's three minutes left on the clock? Or what happens if there's you know, 30 seconds left on the clock, you've just had a turnover, it's your centre pass next, um, you know, and you're playing that to then draw the game or to win by one. So it's about playing around with the time. Um, and we practised an awful lot of eventualities and um, it kind of came into uh, fruition. So, so some, I think some of the things that the group spoke about there, and it's worth picking those out, Alan, you spoke about core skills, the re really important of having real stable, robust core skills, whatever that looks like. We spoke about internal competition, you know, how, how through that preparation period, how you create training, where you deliberately create competition to challenge and to heighten the scenario, because the reality is you can never replicate game day, whatever that looks like, when you walk out in front of 80,000 if you're a top athlete or an exam scenario, it's, it's really, really difficult to replicate those physiological scenarios and mental scenarios that you're in. So yeah, internal competition was great, particularly through training. We spoke about the value of deliberate practice, you know, practice, 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 and that, that links back to the core skills. I think the one, Alex, that you sort of mentioned is unusual those opportunities for really highly critical review. So in those moments in the preparation periods, go into a lot more depth and detail um, than you would traditionally, probably after a major event, because that really helps you te tear it apart. And then generally, you just give examples around different scenarios. So in, in your training, though you create competition, lots of different scenarios that you can try so people feel like they're ready for it. Um, has, has anyone got any particular questions they want to pose to the panel at this moment around that idea of things that you may try or train to be ready for competition? Don't be shy. Yes, yeah, go for it. Um, firstly, thank you all for your contributions. Um, clearly, with pressure, there's going to be a cause for the pressure, mm. and everybody's alluded to types of things you can do to help alleviate that pressure, but ultimately, there's probably one person initially who's going to be feeling that pressure, the individual. Um, so I just want to know, is there any way that any of you have perhaps work with individuals to increase their awareness of, say, what pressure is or how they're feeling that pressure? Good question. <laughs> Go for it. I, sorry, I, I teach yoga um, and I did that in direct response to a particular student who just, I have this awful memory of her performing beautifully and crying while she did so because the stress of it was too much despite the fact that this performance was there and there was something there about we need to feel those pressure at key moments but long-term pressure isn't a positive and that we need to switch off so I've learned an awful lot about talking to the body alleviating the symptoms of pressure within the body and the breath and actually that calms the mind as well and I've used that in scenarios from performing arts schools to exam pressure. Um, and actually being able to know what pressure looks like for you and your body sometimes is easier than kind of trying to go into the mind too much because that can continue and continue sometimes. So kind of talking to the body and allowing the body to talk to the mind and using that as a partly to switch off the pressure after performance, particularly in dance when we have three, four, five shows in a week, um, has proved to be really helpful actually. and something that I incorporate in all my classes. Yeah, yeah um, I had a student about four years ago who um, was exceptionally able and performed like sort of 100% in all the tests in the start of the lower six and then absolutely bombed in the lower six exams. And we had um, sort of lots of conversations about it. And what we decided to do as an action plan was actually fit her <laughs> with a blood pressure monitor and heart rate monitor for the two days before the mock exams in the, in the January. Um, and we collected all the information and we looked at when her stress levels were going up and her heart rate was going up. And we had a you know, we had little, everybody was checking in with her, you know, how are you feeling, how are you feeling? Um, and we, we actually, it turned out it was it was physically walking into the exam room. She was absolutely fine until she started walking, and then her her, her blood pressure was and her heart rate were going absolutely sky high. Um, and it was something about walking in, into that room that caused a problem. So therefore, we were able to adapt her summer exam and make sure that it was in a, a, a room that would allow her to per, allowed her perform. But I think it was it was something ab about just really identifying what the problem is and then trying to track back and see you know, 
what can we do? What can we find out? What more information can, can we get to, to be able to help, help that individual perform on the day? Great. Are you sure you're in the right job? You should be a coach. <laughs> RA monitors. Yeah, Alan. Go I ahead. think that um, some of successes, and, and Rihanna and I talked about this the other day as well, and quite similar to yoga, is um, being able to calm that state down. So, a lot of research into to breathing, and it's kind of a lot from, it, from that yoga perspective about how we actually reduce heart rate and some of those physical symptoms of stress when people find stress is a really, a really good idea. I think, um, I'm really keen on people who struggle on big days having having a really structured day plan. So actually, especially when it's really different. So often people go to competitions and it's leave home at eight o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock start, compete. You go to a major championships, whether it's a national schools championships or world championships, and it's an evening and then you've got to pass all of that time. So how, what do I do? How do I prepare for downtime, for calm time? Or an exam that's later in the day and I'm actually, I'm on exam leave and I've got five hours in the morning which is different. Do I get to that time really tired because I try and cram in that morning? And then how do I manage that time? What's nutrition like? So for example, as a coach, one of my bits is I, I don't drink caffeine on big competition days because I've got a habit of talking too much anyway, I think. So, um, it, I, and talking quickly, I think in my Northern roots, maybe I talk, I talk quite quickly. So um, I don't do that because it makes, it makes me, me talk quicker. So I purposely don't drink caffeine on competition days from my own perspective. And the same thing from a, a competitive perspective. If I'm struggling with stress and that high end awareness, and then I'm drinking an energy drink, then I'm gonna, I've got those physical stimulations that are even, are even worse. So trying to get people to understand what their day looks like, plan their day, what their nutrition is going to be like, and plan it. And then having one or two little, little things in their armory, in their toolbox to, to reduce some of those physical symptoms and stress during that competition period as well. And, and to Dan and Jenna, the, the principle of self-awareness, how do you raise that self-awareness about how people are? I mean, what do you practically do in your environments to make people aware of when they are feeling under pressure and therefore can manage it? Yeah, I think the key thing is to try and get them to identify it and what they do. Um, acknowledging actually that they felt pressure in the first place is actually quite a relieving thing sometimes as well. So when they've gone out and they've necessarily not done particularly well in a situation and they've not acknowledged it at the time, being able to get away from it and then go, actually, did you feel pressure in this time? And then the acknowledgement actually then allows you to go and do something with it because there's an identifiable thing that we can look and target at then, making sure that we can then put a plan around that to be able to give that individual the best chance, whether that be to relax them throughout the day, whether that be to frame things in a different way, use a bit of different language around them to make sure that there's a different vibe on it, for example. But they, you can't do any of that without their belief that there was pressure there in the first place. If they're in denial of that, that, oh no, I wasn't under pressure, I just did it wrong. Right, okay, well we're going to go through the same thing over and over and over, and then fe feel free to do that. But then if they, you can get that acknowledgement in the first place, then there's something we can do about it straight away. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody hasn't acknowledged it? Yes. And so yeah. what, have you, what have you done about um, it? it you, you break down situations, you go, right, well if you were here now, what would you do? And they go, right, I'll do this. But then when you were in this situation there, you did that. And we're quite lucky in that we've got lots of match analysis here. So you can write, that's the ball you bowled, but you've just told me you wanted to bowl this ball. So talk me through that. I was thinking this and that. Were you under, and trying to draw it out of them. And depending upon how stubborn the individuals are around certain things, it may take a bit more time than others, which is part of that development process with them effectively. You know, some will be able to click with it right up, be fe fess up and be fairly honest about it. Others will take quite a long time and be quite belligerent in the fact that no, I just didn't execute my skill. Well, as soon as you can get to that stage, whether that's tomorrow or six weeks time, that's when that creates that learning opportunity to then adapt from there. Great question, thanks. Is anybody got any, anything else you want to ask of the panel? If not, I'll keep grilling them. Okay, great. So I, I think some of the things that came out were about on the day. And we sort of mentioned that, and Jenna, maybe looking back at some recent examples from you, I think it's great doing all that preparation, but you're suddenly put into an environment where it is different. That's just the reality. You go to a major tournament, a major exam, it's really hard to replicate that. That's just, so you know, what have you done, what have you done that you found really worked to support people through that? Um, um, I think it's been different for, for everybody, really, that I've worked with, and I think it depends on, on the individual, and we've just worked with their sort of um, strengths and weaknesses. So. Some um, imagery works for them, some work on quite a bit of self-talk, some have keywords that they use 
um, or that I can say in a game, which will just kind of um, help them more trigger and, and realise sort of what sort of state of mind they're in. Um, some, um, I, I do a little bit of like compartmentalising work with them, so they, we talk about like if you miss a shot, bin it, put it in a box, put it on the shelf, get rid of it, because the next goal is actually super important. So everything sort of works differently for other people, but um, I think, yes, it is a different sort of environment, but one thing that we've done and that actually worked really well for us, um, we lost sort of one major competition a couple of years ago, um, and actually, you know, we went away, we reflected and we talked about it um, and we came back much, much stronger the year after and we came forth in the country, which was great. But uh, one thing I always say to the girls is, it's just me and you guys. Like, there's nobody else here in this room. There's nobody else here. We play our game. You know, you go for ball that you see and you just play the way that we play. Don't worry about the audience. There's nobody else here. You know, don't worry about the screaming fans, the fact they're banging on the on the um, on the sideboards it's just it's just us and I try and keep it as insular as possible for that time so no chatting with parents no phones nothing like that um, and that has been really quite beneficial particularly for the for the younger age groups um, so yeah that's something that I've found that really helped us and, and Rhiannon and Alex have you faced a situation that you, you've you've worked with an individual but yeah you haven't been able to raise awareness about what they're experiencing or help them through it. And what do you do when you're stuck? So you, you've got a toolbox of, you know, we've gone through lots of different ways, but there must be times in your career where you've been working with somebody and you haven't been able to help them. Where do you go to and, and what have you looked for to try to help, help break through that gap as well? I think it's about talking, it's, you know, it's like when you've got a patient in hospital, it's never just one doctor who's in charge of them. There's a sort of multidisciplinary team that's involved and it's just making sure, well, you know, I've, I've tried this, 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 I've been talking to them about, about this, get their, you know, in a boarding environment, get their house, house master and mistress involved, get the group tutor involved, get sport coach. Sometimes it might, it might be that it's the, you know, it's an academic problem, but it could be the sports coach that's able to get through and, and, and to help them and support them in that way, in a way that you can't as the teacher. Yeah. And I think, you know, they, they have, stu students have so many different points of contact and you just hope that if you sort of send the message wide out that, that actually somebody needs support, then somebody will be able to get that, that message home, including, you know, parents, siblings, it's all really, really, really important in that. Yeah, great. And Rain, any, any experiences from you, sir? I think I th there's one particular student when we were preparing for a solo, and there was one particular, you know, it's a really precise thing, there was one particular move, and we went over and over and over, and it, every time she'd fold, and she was meant to dive, and she was, and I thought, I've just got to go alongside her and actually work it out. And so I just did the dance with her, because it's very easy to sit on the sidelines, isn't it? And try it again and, and actually go alongside I went alongside her and discovered that actually this move was really scary and she was her body was scared and she was protecting herself so she never got the move so it became more scary and it became bigger and bigger for her so it was we're scared right now we can work with that emotion we've identified it let's break that down and actually just going alongside her and kind of seeing it from her perspective I hadn't realised that it was a scary move, but it really was. So it was quite interesting just to have that alignment with her. I like to see Alan doing the pole vault. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no. I think there's one two videos out somewhere. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, great. I'm just going to, what I'm just going to do is, has anyone got any particular questions they want to ask of things that they've heard? Can, can I answer yeah, that one? Yeah, well? I, just thinking of it from a, from a coaching perspective was always three things. As, a, as an athlete, I never performed at the level I coached at. Um, so one of the things I did really consistently was I pulled people in from around the world, whoever it was on Skype, who, for example, I had a, a friend of mine who, who coached Olympic champion in, in Sydney. So I managed to have a contact there with the Sydney Olympic champion to then speak to the guys I was coaching who then had jumped higher than I did to say, what does it feel like to jump pole vault six meters? Because I cannot describe this feeling. I just can't do it. And I went around and spoke to all of those people who had jumped that high and said, what does it feel like to do X, Y, and Z? And always made sure through each different kind of stage of my coaching life, I've had a mentor or two or three and a network of people that I can always go to because we cleave as something that's gonna come up that's new, whatever environment I'm coaching in. So having that network as a coach of people you can go to or as a teacher to say, how do you do X, Y, or Z? Or how I've got this, I've never come across it before. What do you think? 
all those people that occasionally can use with with that that pupil or that athlete to say can you go and talk them through this problem because whatever i'm saying what the way i'm saying it's not clicking so can we have the same message but a completely different set of words whether it's a peer or another teacher or another coach is i think is really really powerful as well great um oh, one thing that a couple of you picked up on was just around um the concept of the critical review. So one of the things I sort of mentioned in the opening element of it was the very much is, uh, we're trying to use pressure here for a pressure for a positive force. And part of the positive force is in those moments where it's really, really difficult, how do you review from it and bounce back so you're much stronger? That, that's the idea. Of course, too much causes the opposite. But I think, so that critical review period, which we say helps build resilience, is a massive, massive important element. So can you just expand the type of things you go through in a very critical review process that help people understand what happened and therefore gives them, I guess, more energy, I guess, more resilience. So when it happens again, they're ready for it. So when they get to the competition. So can you just share experiences of, of review processes that you've been involved with and how you really get underneath it so people become really aware of, of what's happened? Yeah, go. Um, so when we, I've already sort of touched on it, but when we didn't make that um, sort of national comp a couple of years ago, um, the girls were gutted, um, absolutely devastated, um, as was I. And we sort of left and we sat down when we come back to school. We left it a couple of days, so I do sort of a hot debrief there and then, and then we leave it, um, allow the land to sort of lie for a couple of days, and then we sort of catch up again. And um, they were still pretty devastated when we got back together and we just, we watched the footage um, and we, we had a really good chat, all of us, and we just discussed what went well, what didn't go well. Uh, we talked about the process and the build-up. Uh, we talked about individuals within the team. Uh, we talked about training sessions and coaching and the fixtures and the prep. And we just literally covered everything. Um, and I just said, well, what are we going to do differently next year? Because they said, you know, we, we can't do this again, Miss. So, you know, we don't want to be in this position again. What are we going to do? And I said, well, you know, these are the key areas that you've outlined to me. How are we going to fix them? And actually, I, I just put it back on them and I gave them the ownership for it. And I had several sort of one-to-ones. I met sev uh, separately with the leadership team. Um, and actually, there were some cracking girls within that group that just completely turned the culture around and everybody then sort of came on board and was singing off the same hymn sheet. The intensity in training was so much better. Um, and then that was the year that we went on and, and came forth. And I, I think for me, actually, that was one of my proudest moments to go from something that was really, really low when actually, you know, they were way more than capable and should have been in that national final. Um, and yeah, they, they, they've, on paper, we've got some ridiculously talented kids, but we just didn't perform, and why? Um, and as individuals, it was great, but actually as a team, it just didn't work. So we went away and we did a lot of work on um, the team, and actually nobody's bigger than the team. Um, and yeah, the resilience on that was huge. They just absolutely ran with it. They set their own goals, and they completely turned it around, and yeah, they were just talking throughout. Um, yeah, massive. Great. Uh, anyone else from a different stories? There, well, there? I think one of the big things for me is being providing that person with with ownership of what's going to come next, but being really critical of both what's what the mistakes we've made and what we've done well. And I, I genuinely believe to go forwards, we always have to be able to repeat and build on the things we've done well because so many reviews look at something, especially if it's not gone as quite as planned on all of the things that went wrong. And somewhere in the middle of that, wicket, it's quite easy to lose what we did really, really well. And I think that when we talk back to that, that love and that passion for what we're doing comes from understanding we are really good at this and something didn't go well, but okay, this is now what we've got in place to, to, to build and, and strengthen what, we, what we, was our weakest point. But actually, what are we gonna build and develop our strengths from? What are we good at? And how are we gonna do that to keep developing that passion and love? Because I think if you come off a, off a performance you've struggled in and you come back to training and things are very down, it's very difficult to, to, for, a, for a performer to come in and think, right, I really wanna commit and drive this forwards. If within that, I'm also not reflecting, saying actually I have got something really positive that I can come back and get better at and keep doing those things really well. So I think looking at those two areas of those things we can improve, but also drive the things that we, we are really strong at is really, really important to do as part of that process. Yeah, Alex and Ryan. Yeah, yeah just um, simple things like actually keeping all the tests that you do for a subject in a certain part of your 
folder or having having a separate folder for them so every time that you do a test and you have your reflection sheet you're putting it in the same place which kind of makes you open it up and you go Ooh, don't, oh god do you remember that was that last one you know don't want that again and it's just kind of reminding yourself of the journey that you've been on rather than just um you know having it as a one-off event and i think that that's that's really important to think of tests as part of the journey and and and, and have them as as part as uh, part of the way that you're going to move forward and to continually be revisiting the way you performed in the past. So like, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the reality of the school environment here is we have real diverse wide age groups and everybody would feel pressure. So what, what's your approach around and if there's any gender differences? Because interestingly, the work I spoke about here with Vincent Walshoff on decision making, when under pressure, males and females will typically respond very differently. So that creates a different situation that we need to think about. And, and Dan probably coaching both men and women, you could give some examples there. But also, I think the reality of brain development, the more that we've understood it, we realise certain parts of the brain um, are not formed into late adolescence or as a young individual. So your risk-taking behaviour when under pressure also changes dramatically. So you may be coaching, supporting, educating 10, 11 year olds versus 17, 18 year olds. And the development capacity is so diverse. You know, so again, male, females, different age groups. What's your, what do you do differently among those to help, help use pressure in the right way so they continue to grow and develop? Uh, I, tr I try to find what, what and how they react first and foremost. I mean, you look at the body language of most people, it's a fairly good indicator of what they're feeling right there and then. So you could put a question out to them that in the back of their head, they really desperately don't want you to ask. And then all of a sudden their body language changes and you know that it's there. And just being give that awkward silence to be able to see how they deal with those things and looking at different people and how they react to that. How do they react to different people walking in the room? So knowing that person and being able to develop a strategy from there but also reframing stuff for people who put so much pressure on themselves that actually you've got to look at things as a positive. So people walking in going, oh, there's loads of people here watching. Well, that's a good thing, because they think you're worthwhile watching, as opposed to, why are all these people here looking at me sort of thing. So depending upon the, the person you've got in front of you, which doesn't necessarily, from what I've experienced, work from male to female, just works on where they've been before, what their experiences are, effectively drives where you go with those different people. Yeah, so it's not necessarily about if you gender or age, you look at them as an individual in the context and your questioning will enable you to understand where they're at and you respond to that accordingly. Yeah, yeah, great. So I could go into like a, a year nine team review and I'd chuck a question out and we could sit there and I'd just wait until someone says something and just two, three minutes and then, oh, but then you go into, so the mayor's 11 change room, you chuck that question out and someone will chuck something out and they go, no, I disagree. And then all of a sudden it becomes this proper discussion that 10, 11 people are involved in that I can just sit in the corner and just listen to this like, actually formulate. But because they've had that development phase of sitting in that awkward silence for two or three minutes when they were 13, 14 years old, they've had that chance to actually go, well, no, I need to say what I think here because otherwise we're going to sit here in silence. So being able to give them the chance to work those things out is just as important as actually the pressure itself. I'm going to remember that one, sit in silence. Mm -hmm. Remember that the next time as a, as a trick. Yeah, go, go. See, I was going to say, so as it's exactly the same for, for the girls that I coach, particularly the younger years, and you'll ask them a question and they'll just kind of stare at you. Um, so now what I do is I say, talk about it to the person next to you. And then it kind of like they have a little chat and then I'll say, you know, can you feed back to me or can you do this? And then, yeah, and then by the time you're sort of a little bit older, 18, 19, you're just, yeah, you just, it's that sort of challenging, questioning, probing discussion and it's, it's far different. But yeah, it's kind of like prepping them for when they get that little bit older. But what often I find is, uh, or that I've learnt with age groups, is no matter what age or what ability, if you can make pressure fun um, and competitive, and they enjoy it. I can do exactly the same practice with, you know, sort of the, the 14 year olds as I can with, you know, the Welsh girls. And they love it, whether it's shooting pressured games, whether it's, you know, overloading or, you know, as long as you put some sort of competitive element on there, they love it. And actually, they then don't really see it as pressure because they don't realise what they're doing because they're having fun and laughing when they're doing it. So that's what I've sort of learnt. Um, and I think it's quite important when we talk about fun in part of development. It's Fun just doesn't mean having a giggle. For some people, fun is very different. It is competition. Um, it is physical contact. For others, it's very different. And so understanding that in relation to development is a really important thing as well. And any, any final comments for Rhianne and Alex? Yeah, um, 
I think you know when you when you come a teacher for the first time, you realise you know when you have the like the year sevens and eights, they really whip themselves up into this frenzy when it comes to exams. Um, and actually, by the time they're taking GCSEs, yes, yeah, some of them are, do have issues with pressure, but a lot of them are, are quite calm about it. And I think it's that those early years, sort of 11 to 14, really needs really strong um, sort of messaging coming from all their teachers and their coaches, things like that. Now, actually, calm down. Don't, you know, just you know, don't whip yourselves up like this. And sort of being really sort of proactive about it and knowing that that's going to happen before they have their summer exams and things like that, because um, you know, it, it 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 can become very very destructive um, and set totally the wrong message from what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, Marianne, anything? Learning to make mistakes, I think, is really important. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in dance or in any theatre or performance is that we, it's live. Mm. It's going to be different every night. It's go we are going to, to make mistakes. It will be slightly different. Actually, that's the thrill and the love of it as well. That's the most exciting thing. But if we can, within the classroom, within the studio, within the rehearsal, make mistakes and recover quickly, make more mistakes, be okay with making mistakes. Actually, we're building that resilience, but also that confidence so that something will go wrong on stage, absolutely. At some point, something will. Um, but if we can recover, you know, not let it show possibly at some times, there's something with that that is really, really exciting for our more confident, more experienced performers. Um, but at a younger age, if, if we're not making mistakes and we are kind of moving in this kind of expectation that it's going to be perfect, then those mistakes can be really, really destructive. Um, so I, I, I like making mistakes. Let's fall over. Mm. Let's, let's do that. And, and then let's recover. Or sometimes let's find the most creative stuff we do when those mistakes happen. And that can be really exciting in any studio. So I think that's lovely. Great. Well, well, thank you. There are some absolute nuggets in there, believe it or not. Um, and, and there's lots, of, even when we're just sort of exploring around uh, the types of things you do when pressure's there and the things that you focus on. We spoke earlier about core skills, internal competition, how you create that in that type of environment. We spoke about deliberate practice scenarios, how you replicate those all the time, you know, right, right through to encouraging mistakes to be a natural part of that development process. Always deal with the person in front of you. It doesn't matter about gender, it doesn't matter about age, but you have different tools in your toolbox to do that. So, great. Well, thank you very much for giving up your Wednesday evening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please watch the YouTube back, because as I say, there'll be some great content in there to think about going forward and share the word with all your colleagues. Thank you. If you can put your hands together and thank the panel.